Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay, from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us today is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Josh Lindsay. Hello. And with us, as always, is our trusty, dusty research extraordinaire, button pushing guy, Jason Rugg. Hey there. Hi, Jason. And this is so exciting. This is like the third week in a row. We have a guest with us is David Patterson, filmmaker extraordinaire, producer of The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Hello, David. Hello, extraordinaire. I'll, I'll use that for at least 20 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we got you for an hour. So um, okay. where, where are you right now, David? I'm on Long Island, uh, Nassau County. Not the happiest place for uh COVID-19 right now, but uh, I'm hunkered in my basement and uh, doing okay. Okay. Well, we're glad you're doing well. Thanks for being here. I just uh, want to give a little shout out about David for one second before we get into the nitty gritty of filmmaking. Um, David is not only an executive producer of our film, I love giving him his, giving his resume because he's a stuntman. He's a firefighter. He's a park commission uh, uh what do we he call parks him? commissioner yeah he's the parks commissioner um he's a, a stay-at-home dad of two boys um and he's also you know a movie producer so uh he just is sort of a a really eclectic awesome interesting individual and he not only was he a firefighter at uh ground zero um, and he can talk more about that later, but he has now been working during this COVID outbreak and, um, you know, in a really terrible part of New York City. So they've had been hit really hard. He's lost his um, wife's grandmother passed away. They had to do a 15 minute car funeral, which was absolutely awful. And when you talk to somebody like David, you learn that um, that what you hear about on the news is not just news. It really affects people and their lives. And David and I talk every day or every other day. And so I've sort of been on this journey with him since the beginning of March. And I just want to say thank you for what you've been doing to take care of your family and to take care of your friends and neighbors and yourself so that you can continue going to people's houses and helping them in their time of danger. So thank you for doing all those things for us and sure. continuing to work on movie things, which seems very unimportant in the light of all that. So, Well, they are a good distraction. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Well, before we jump into uh, talking to David and learn about his background and what it means to be an executive producer, uh, Christian, why don't you update us uh, where the girl who wore freedom is right now? What, what's new and exciting? Yes, thank you for asking that. I'm about ready to pull my hair out and I'm asking myself, why in the world did I ever get into this business? <laughs> um, this past week's been really rough. Um, it's been rough because I'm having to face every single solitary day, everything that I did wrong. <laughs> and so, like I said, this should be how not to make a documentary. And the biggest you know, problem I'm facing this week is the fact that I had no idea what to do about archival images. And so, we're still dealing with um, trying to find the right resolution archival images that are public, you know, domain use. And that has involved talking to, you know, archivists and researchers and people in France and people in the United States. And um, I did work this week with a woman, a wonderful woman named Gina McNally or uh, McNeely. And she said she's been working as an archivist and a researcher at the National Archives for 26 years. She watched our film and she said, the good news is this is an amazing, unique film. It's really, really good. The bad news is because of that, I've never seen these images. <laughs> so I can't help you. <laughs> And, and that's not been the only thing. I, I mean, we use a few iconic images, but for the most part, we searched really, really hard to find images that people had not used before. And um, that's great. It makes our film interesting, but it also creates a very big problem when you're trying to find the original high quality images. And 
when I talked to her, she said, well, Christian, nobody's ever done this perspective before. So it looks like what happened was when, and this, I mean, I've learned more about archive research than I've ever learned in my life, but basically they will, researchers will go to the archives and you have to know your history and you have to know the units and where they were, where they went, what location they were in. And so you go there to the archives and you ask them for the 101st Airborne Division in Normandy. And they bring you a box of thousands of photos just dumped in there like they came out of your grandmother's attic. And you have to just look through them and find them and then scan them and then you're allowed to use them. But because people have been so focused on the war, all of the images of the French civilians are still sitting in the boxes. Most of them haven't been scanned in. And so that's why they're not readily available. The ones that have, they're on Getty images and a researcher will have scanned them. They will have made a deal with Getty. So they're on Getty, but Getty will charge you almost a thousand dollars per image just to use it in your film because they can, because they know it's hard for you to get. So what I do think did happen, and hopefully when the archives in France open up, there is the Manche archives. They have, they sent a researcher to the National Archives and they downloaded and scanned 4,000 photos and took them back to France. And my guess is those are the ones that, you know, they're looking for the French people and the damage and all of that. So that's probably where our images, our high quality images are. So we've also been looking for video reels and the video situation is even more complicated than the picture situation sometimes. So we're still trying to find needles in a haystack and we're still, we're finding that we have to pay more money than we ever expected. So, um, so that's kind of where we are this week. We were hoping that we would be able to take the film and send it to the colorist on Friday so that then they could color the whole film. And that's like super, super close to being at the end. But now I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that if we do not get these images upgraded by Friday. So would you say, you know, in terms of learning from this experience and how you do it differently when it comes to archival footage, is it a matter of just picking stuff that you know you have? That the way that it should happen, yeah. you should, before you ever begin, when you have an idea and you've decided you want to do a movie that has anything archival in it, hire an archival producer ah, okay. from the very beginning who knows what they're doing. And they already know this landscape and their job is to go and collect the images, you know, that you're looking for to at least, like if I said, I want an elderly woman in her forties, you know, dressed in a house dress, standing in a field, they would go and find as many images as they could of that and bring it back to me and say, now you choose. And then I would choose from that as opposed to what we did, which is go find the exact image that we want, whether or not we had the rights to it or not, and, and put it in our film and get attached to it and tell our story around it, and then maybe not be able to use it. If I can jump in for a second, um, that is probably the most deadliest phrase in independent filmmaking, we'll figure it out later. That is something that has sunk more ships in show business than you can count the stars in the sky. So it's a very good point that when you say, we'll figure it out later, there's someone in that room going, oh, no. And, uh, and, and, and it usually comes back to bite you on the ass uh, down the road. Can I say that? I mean, it, yes. that's, that's a gentle cuss word. But, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. That's that's one thing. We'll figure it out later. Is this very a phrase that should never be ever ever used on set uh, or when you're in your first meeting uh, for making a movie? Yes, I agree with you completely. I wish we had met two years ago. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Would you say that's similar to the phrase "We'll fix that in editing"? Yeah. We'll fix that in post. Yeah. In post. Okay. Yeah, we'll fix that in post. Don't ever say that. In fact, I think that's what Hitler said about D-Day. Uh, <laughs> you know. Figure it out later. Christian, I noticed uh, you're wearing a, a very cool sweatshirt. 
Yes. Do you love this? This is my love new it. Girl Who Wore Freedom sweatshirt. You can find it on normandystories.com slash shop. Um, we have got really cool items there. T-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, hats, and all of them go to help support the film. So it isn't much, but it's something. And uh, yeah, we would we would love for you to uh, visit our shop and purchase a little merch. Awesome. And any other crazy updates we need to know about, Christian? Well, one thing that is exciting this week is we've been asked by the town of Carenton to participate in their virtual D-Day, which is super exciting because they want me to talk about why Normandy is so important to me and why I love it. So I was, and all they did was ask me to do that. And I thought, well, I could do that easily, but I don't really want to necessarily do that alone. So then I started brainstorming with what could I do to be a blessing to them on D-Day? And I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can get some veterans to send them a message. So I reached out to several veterans in our film and they were so excited. Several of them couldn't go to Normandy for D-Day. So they were really sad. So they were super happy to send them a message. So I've got personalized messages to the people of Normandy from veterans. And then a bunch of people in our crew have uh, made signs and did little videos that said, thank you. And so we're going to string all that together this week and give that to the people of Normandy so that they will, they'll put us in their virtual D day, but then we'll probably do something special with those, you know, in the film websites and social media on D day as well. So I'm super excited about that. If you're hearing this, um, you, and you're interested in doing this, you could send us a video, write me at Christian at the girl who wore freedom.com or Christian at Normandy stories.com. And, um, I'll tell you instructions about how to join us. That's great. Well, Hey, why don't we get to know, uh, the executive producer, David, this is uh, very cool. I, it's, it's great to finally meet you. David heard lots about you. It's you, you've been one of Christian's favorite finds when it comes to for networking and, and, and we've been people. talking about you now for a couple of months. You haven't been listening, <laughs> I don't think, but I'm, I'm like a shiny new thing. You'll get bored soon enough, but uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm fun to play with. But then, well, you know. until we get bored with you, we'd like to learn more about your background. You, you've got an extensive background in filmmaking. Um, I thought that was fascinating. You're a stuntman. Do you still do stunt work? I still do stunt work. Absolutely. Wow. As you get older, they get a little bit more concerned about you breaking. So uh, what, but what people don't know is, you know, there's so much safety involved uh, on sets with stunt work that whenever you see a stunt man, there's generally half a dozen stunt men behind him in one way or another uh, still on set. You know, there's people that have to rig the sets. There's guys that, uh, Stuntmen tend to do the carpentry and, and construction of the ramps and stuff. Uh, one of my specialties is on water safety uh, because New York City is surrounded by water. Uh, you need several men to operate several boats. Uh, say if you see in a movie some kid in a, in a rowboat, just out of camera range, there tends to be three to four other boats right there. Okay. There has to be uh, a boat with a single driver and a scuba diver just in case the kid decides to go deep six it. Uh, you generally have a boat with the, the crew and the director and the cinematographer. Then you also have to have a nearby chase boat with costumes and makeup. Um, and sometimes we have huge boats out there and you just need guys walking around to make sure no stupid extra, you know, decides to do a header uh, into the ocean. So Water safety is a big job. So I've done a lot of work where you've never seen me, except if you stay to the very end of the credits. Uh, but the pay's good. I'll take it. Um, I have been shot, stabbed, drowned, and strangled. But actually, that's just for my marriage. That has nothing to do with... Uh, sorry, my wife hates that joke, believe it or not. But, uh, yeah. But uh, no. So yeah. I mean, actually, I was just, just the other, a couple months ago, I was shot. And, uh, you know, that was fun. <laughs> um, again, doing stunt work, not the wife. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it slows down uh, in respects to the more dangerous stuff, but there's always work. There's always work because they always want people that either have done it before or know what's knows the environment. Um, safety is a big thing nowadays. I'm sure, in the past, you've heard of stupid things done by stupid people on on sets 
that ended tragically. So the unions are very, very uh, cognizant of that and are, are very safe, safety driven now. What I love about that story, David, is that you learned to be a stuntman in England, right? Yes. I, uh, there's this thing called money, which colleges require a lot of, even back in the 80s. And <laughs> so I didn't always have it. So I went to school for a little bit. Then I left for a year. Then I went back for a little bit. Then I left for a year. And during one of my breaks, I went to uh, London. I wanted to become a stuntman. And back then, um, there really weren't any programs in the United States for stuntmen. So I went to RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, where they had a stage fight uh, program, stage combat. And so I trained under Sir Jonathan Waller. He's no longer with us, but he did all the violence for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So he was the Black Knight that had all the limbs cut off. And, uh, oh. he, he was a great guy. And so I learned to become a stuntman there. And when I came back, I started to do stunt work. Uh, then moved to New York City because I fell in love and uh, been there ever since. And then when we decided to have kids, I said, you know, how difficult could it be? I'll stay home with, at that point, the one child. Um, as Christian knows, I used to be six foot eight. I'm currently five nine. Uh, that's what <laughs> happens when men stay home with children. It does break <laughs> your spirit and your spine. And uh, so, so I started my writing career while trapped at home with two small children and took a break from the acting and stunt work and crazy enough went back to the stunt work just about a little over 10 years ago uh, once the boys rolled enough for me to abandon and you know actually start doing something outside of the house but during the time i was home i really started uh, concentrating on writing and uh started out as a playwright uh then um well I became a, a fireman after 9-11. And um, what happened was I was writing, staying home with the kids. And uh, if I can briefly brag, but it's actually tragic. Um, in 1998, I became the only playwright in the history of American theater to have three plays premiere on New York stages in one month. One was Broadway, one was off Broadway, and one was off off Broadway. And I made the papers, New York Times, London Times, you know, all this big press. But I still couldn't get an agent because I was a playwright and there was no money in that. So uh, I just sort of went back to my my thing, raising the boys, continuing to write. And then 9-11 happened and I, to put my way through law school, I did construction. So I had a construction demolition background. So I kind of walked into ground zero after the attacks and worked there for a couple of days. Uh, without my wife's permission, she was rather upset to wake up to a note by the bed. But uh, again, I just wanted to get out of the house. I, the children were driving me crazy. <laughs> so, um, but when I came home, I told her two things. I felt I wanted to do something more for my city and my country. And by then, I was already too old for New York City Fire Department. They have a 30-year-old uh, cutoff age, and I had missed it by a bunch of years. So I joined a fire company out on Long Island, and uh, we're the Second largest on Long Island, so we're, we're pretty big and very busy. We get about 3,000 calls a year. Um, but after joining that, I told my wife, um, working at Ground Zero, I knew I was a good writer, uh, and I was just waiting for someone to discover me, but I could get on a plane tomorrow, and it may never land. And so my success actually depended on me. And so I said, I'm going to take one of my plays that had done fairly well, and put together a little bit of money. And there's this film festival in California called um, Sundance. I think I said the Sundance in, uh, in California. And of course, it's not in California. It's, <laughs> and it's in Utah. But I didn't even know that. That's how ignorant I was. And I said, I'll just make a little movie with a little bit of money. I know this guy, Kevin Smith. Don't really know who he is, but he did it. And he's a nobody. So... Uh, I did that. I made a movie, submitted it to Sundance, and got in. And it was quite a turnaround from my life. And literally, I've been making movies since Sundance in 2005 on a fairly regular basis. And um, I've just been very, very fortunate to, to make um, a couple features and a couple docs and a couple shorts. And also, there's been documentaries that... I wasn't on the ground floor of, but came across uh, one way or another. And of course, this film is one of those very films. Yeah. 
So I think most people generally have the idea of what a screenwriter does, but you're also a film producer. So can you talk about your role as a film producer and, and what you do? Right. Well, for uh, the films that uh, I wrote, um, I was a writer producer because it was the only way to get, get them made. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is, if I wanted someone else to produce it, that means I would have to knock on a thousand doors and beg a thousand times to get a thousand no's. Uh, and that's what most filmmakers go through. Um, so I just tried to use all of my world experience um, to, um, to, to work it around other elements of making films and, and do non-filmatic things to get stuff done. Um, my very first film, Love Ludlow, cost $75,000 to make, but anyone who's in the film business, we shot it on, on film. Uh, back then and and back then film was very expensive but um, what I did was use all my connections in the community that I developed over the years to get what's called in-kind services which basically means free stuff and in the end we realized that if you added what we would have spent on the budget of the film it would have come in around a quarter of a million dollars but I got a lot of free stuff and it was because of my community connections, both as a fireman, but also I had also been uh, an emergency management coordinator for my village. And just, you know, I'm, as a stay at home mom, to be honest, you know, with hair on his chest, uh, I was in a town where I literally was the only stay at home mom. All the others were actually real women. And you get a rep <laughs> reputation for that as well. I mean, all the moms love you and all their husbands hate you. But, uh, you know, you, are able to make your connections that way to get stuff done too. And, and people know people who know people and they say, this is a good guy, help them out. Um, and so producing is, is really, some people call it a traffic cop. Um, I, I would say it's, you're not just the traffic cop, but you're actually the um, police office. I mean, you tend to do everything. Uh, there are no. all, and yeah. I'll tell you, David, you just reminded me of something I say to people all the time, which is I learned to be a producer because I was a mom. Yeah. You have to manage time, budgets, people's schedules, and you have to get deliverables done. And that's what a producer is. And it's what a mom is. So it's interesting because you and I basically both cut our teeth as a producer the same way. Absolutely. I mean, the amount of responsibility is astronomical, but it's actually easier than raising children. So it's really, uh, you know, the organization level, you know, it is, is, it's amazing. Um, I, uh, I've worked so much with women um, over the times because of being a stay at home. I'll say dad, my wife said, hates it when I say stay at home mom, but it, it usually gets a chuckle, but uh, working with women overall and watching my wife climb the corporate ladder, um, I realized how much men are pretty much idiots. Um, and, and one of the lectures I give at film festivals is how to stay on budget and finish under time, hire women, uh, because women are not only more organized, but they have this thing called guilt, uh, which men do not have at all. And so women want to get things done. They want to please you. They don't want to screw up. Men have none of these skill qualities. Uh, and so if you want a film to be a complete disaster, make sure you don't have a single woman on the project. And I can guarantee you it will crash and burn probably on day three. So uh, I, I actually try to hire as many women as possible on all levels because they get the job done. Sorry, dudes, who's listening to this. The, the bad guys know who they are, and the good guys know that I'm still right. So and, and anyone who takes himself to it, you don't want to work with that person anyway. So speaking of working with women, how did you meet Christian and get involved in The Girl Who Wore Freedom? Well, as a producer, um, you're, always, you're always hustling, and you're always trying to figure out a connection that you can make. And so – my college magazine came by and uh, I immediately go, I'm sure there's really good articles. I almost always skip them. And I go to the alumni graduate section 
and start checking out the years um, and looking speci specifically for the arts and entertainment people, the theater or music or whatever, and see where they are now. Because you may have hated them back in college, but now they actually could be someone important. <laughs> so you're, and, and hopefully you weren't a jerk to them way back when. And so I came across Christian's name and it was crazy because I'm like, okay, she graduated the same time as I did, but I have absolutely no memory of her whatsoever. And our department had like 12 people in it. So um, <laughs> I, I want to predicate this as I was a professional drinker back then. I still am. So it's very possible. I just not read her or recognize her, or I did talk to her and did not remember it during those several years I went to college. But it mentioned her, her uh, film, and I, uh, I, I think I went to IMDb Pro, which is a, a listing of uh, a production listing uh, for films. I think that's where I got your email, Christian. I think I looked it up that way. Oh, no, no. It was in the article because the whole point of the article was like, please find me. Please write to me. Please help me. Please donate. This is <laughs> article. If you want to look it up, it's called She Followed the Parachutes. And it's one of the best articles that was written about our film, written by Ellen Woods from CUA Magazine. And so that was the article. It came out in October. We, it was written after we screened in D.C., um, that's where our college alma mater is. It's Catholic University of America. And I do think it's just crazy. The more that David and I have gotten to know each other, we realize we have, I mean, I don't know, it, we would have to like have worked to avoid each other because we knew all the same people. We have a lot of the same memories of just different stuff, but we have no recollection of one another. I mean, we took the same classes. We had the same teachers. We had the same friends. I think um, we worked on some of the same shows. But we you even worked on some of the same. And I was on stage. Yeah, so. it's crazy. So I don't even know how that's possible. But uh, what was crazy is I do remember getting this email uh, which was, you know, you may not remember me, but we went to college together and, um, you know, I'm on, I'm a producer and I've, I'm on these film festival boards and you said you wanted to go to film festivals. If you need any help, let me know. So I picked up the phone immediately and I called him <laughs> and I was like, hi. And we talked and we found out we had all these things in common. And at the end of the conversation, he offered me $500 donation, but he wanted me to use it on film festival entries. And I was like, hmm, I don't think so. $500 doesn't really buy very much. How about if you keep your money and you come on board? And yeah. here he is today. The dumbest deal I've ever made. The best deal I've ever made. <laughs> No, no, come on. Get no, no, real. I'm talking about the money thing. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like. I know, but, but, but truthfully, okay, truthfully, be honest with me. We've Smart now one. been. Hardest deal I ever made. So it's I was been, just, It's been good, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, again, being a fireman, I've been in some pretty hairy fires, uh, but none of them nearly as scary as some of the things she's dug herself into. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's. Part of, the, part of the producer's job is to go, okay, how, how do we solve this or how do we fix this? And uh, But all joking aside, um, when she sent me a link to the to the film, uh, because initially I, th I think I hesitated on saying yes until I saw the you, film. Yeah, you did. You did. And we weren't going to say yes. Right. And then I said, I'm on board because not only is it a good film, it's, it's actually a great film, but the fact that it was a first time filmmaker um, who took on such a behemoth of a project. Uh, it's, it's, it's telling to her skill and talents inherent in her that obviously because she didn't go to film school. So she was just winging this. Um, That's true. And, and naivete can be some of your best weaponry uh, when you're making a film. Because what you don't know may not kill you if you're able to get through it. And uh, so uh, she's already won looking at this film. If, I think you guys have all seen it. And some of the people obviously on this podcast have not. Uh, but anyone can go to is it Norman, Normandy Stories Norman Stories com com? Mm -hmm. to see the um, trailer. And the trailer speaks, speaks mountains of the project. 
and you can say, holy cow, this is something I want to see. And so when I saw the trailer, it's like, holy cow, this is something I would like to be a part of. And, and however I can. Well, and I think what's so interesting too is not only were you moved by the project, but it tapped into some of your own family history, which I didn't learn about like till we went to Sundance. So tell us about your military, you know, you know connections. connections. Well, uh, my, my grandfather actually was an ambulance driver for the French in World War I. Um, he joined up before the Americans were in and he was with an American division and uh, he was wounded 11 days before the armistice. He lost a leg and was mustard gassed and talked like this, you know, for the rest of his life. But he was my hero. Uh, I had uncles that were in uh, late, the late part of World War II and, and uh, Korea. I grew up uh, in a military town, Norfolk, Virginia, or Norfolk, as we would say. All my friends uh, went into the military. Um, I briefly looked into it, uh, but I was already acting, and the Navy's drama department was really, really kind of weak. <laughs> um, thank you for anyone who chuckles. There is no drama department uh, in the Navy, by the way. So I decided, you know, to pursue my career uh, as as an actor, um, but, you know, always close to my military friends. And, you know, I found out later after coming on board, talking to my mother that uh, I, I had a, a cousin and uh, two cousins, uh, once removed, however that works out, uh, that were in uh, the 101st. And one, on was, one, one actually paratrooped in uh, and the other one was a, uh, a glider on a glider on D-Day. And my Isn't mother- Isn't that so cool? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it truly is amazing, uh, one degree removed of how many people had someone who was either in D-Day immediately or the, or the days to follow or weeks to follow. It's, it's just unbelievable how many people have connections. Well, 13% uh, of the United States population was uh, involved in World War II in, during that time. And that doesn't sound like a lot, except when you think about today, it's less than 1% of the population is in our military. So 13% of our military back in the 40s during World War II, everybody knew somebody that was in the war. And so many people had lots of relatives in the war. And so then you extrapolate that out with children and grandchildren. That's why there are so many people in the world now who can say, I had an uncle, I had an aunt, I had a grandfather that was in World War II. Uh, but, you know, it, it's very different now. It's not like that so much anymore. But it was very meaningful to me that David came to us um, not only with a passion for storytelling, clearly, um, but, you know, he loved this film, but he also had this connection and tie-in with World War II, which I thought was really neat. So, David, what, what's your role now as an executive producer? What specifically, going forward, are, are, is your role in The Girl Who Wore Freedom? Well, I guess initially uh, it was once I said, all right, tell me where we're at. There was a lot of uh, finger shaking at her. Uh, about no, 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 you, you shouldn't have done that. And after a certain point, she's like, all right, well, this is already done. So how do we move forward? And so a lot of my uh, job is to tell her how to move forward, but cautiously. And I'll, I'll say this up front. I said it to her. I say it to everyone I meet. I trust no one. And this sounds very negative, but you should be in this respect of the business. I tell uh, Christian, everyone I know, everyone's a liar until they prove to me that they're not. And again, any liar will take immediate insult to that. And anyone who's not a liar will go, well, I'm not a liar. You know, you, you know so, but it's really important to get everything down on paper, not to leave anything unsaid or undone and not trust someone to do something that they say they're going to do and then sort of let them go on their own way. So I guess that's more where the traffic cop element comes in. It's, it's how are we proceeding forward? It's um, in a lot of ways a bully, because uh, I will say to Christian, you know, you said you were gonna do this, did you do this? And if she says, well, I was unable to do this because of this, I'm like, well, all right, well, let's figure out if we can fix that. Or 
if we come to a blockade, how do we go around that blockade? Uh, when it comes to film festivals, uh, I my f films have been in over 100 film festivals throughout the world. So being Scottish and being a cheap bastard, I told her not to submit to any festivals until she tells me because I can probably get us either a discount or get us into it for free. Which and, he has. And, and that adds up. Think about it. It does it, add up. 75 bucks a pop to 100 bucks a pop for a festival, 10 festivals, that, that's 1,000 bucks right there. And, and we've, entered, um, we've entered almost 60. And, you know, and there's going to be a lot of no's. So, again, being Scottish, a $100 no is really painful to me. Yeah. So I, I would prefer. And, and, in fact, we would approach festivals that we didn't even have a direct connection to, but we would try to use one angle or another as, you know, being a, a charitable film, uh, donation-only film. Uh, we're, we're tough on number. Are there any, you know, discounts that you give some actually give discounts to first-time filmmakers um i wanted to go back to college so we could just apply all to student applications but, uh, <laughs> that would have cost extra money to go to college so we, we we tossed that idea um so what's been amazing is that he did come on you know theoretically to be in charge of like festival and distribution strategy and that really is where i've relied on him for his expertise but as you can see, he brings so much more to the table, um, and he has so much industry knowledge that I don't. That I don't. And when I met him, I told him he was an incredible answer to prayer. He was exactly what I needed. I needed him in the beginning, but I needed him when I found him more than ever because um, we were just starting to figure out this back half, and I was clueless. I literally was praying every week that I would find somebody that could help me with the film festival landscape. And, um, you know, David just was a godsend. So, um, you know, it began that way, but because of his expertise, he's become much more than that. And he truly, um, what I love about working with him is that um, he cares very much about the project, just like I do. And he, I feel very empowered by David. Um, he's one of these better angels in the production world where when he says, I want to support you and help you achieve what your vision is, um, he means that. I don't feel like he's trying to take over or he, you know, has any, anything but, you know, altruistic motives really uh, because he loves to do good work and he's a good man and um, he can be hard with me and he has held me accountable for things, but in a gentle way with a great sense of humor. And it's it's sort of like one of the, he apparently did a very good job as a stay at home mom because he has that kind of hard, like he is very hard, but you know, he loves you kind of thing. He kind of got that down. And so I don't, um, I take whatever he has to say you know, seriously. And I, I think it's been, it's been good. He's helped. He's the one that helped me craft my pitch to Michelin. And because he's a writer, he's even able to help out with the writing. And I haven't really had anybody who's helped me in that pitch department like that. So um, that's been a blessing. And, you know, I just, I mean, I can't talk enough about how he has helped this project and elevated it. Um, in so many different ways. And and not only that, like we haven't even talked about what you did when you got your film into Sundance in terms of how you got the marketing and the support to do a film festival run. That's an incredible story. Well, we should do that for another podcast because I think we should more talk about you I mean, yeah, and, and this film. So, I mean, just to add on that, that as a producer, part of my responsibility is not only to make a better film, but also protect the filmmaker. Um, whether it's a, a season pro or a full timer, because it's a tough, tough business. And yet you are an artist and you should try to keep them less distracted by the business element, which is nasty and sucks, uh, and have them focus on the art. And when I say focus on the art, that doesn't just mean they wrote a directed film, they're done. No, it is. They still got to pursue archival stuff. There's still many, many responsibilities that they have to do in post um, that they need to concentrate on. 
And so if you as a producer can run interference or help on other elements that they just don't have the time or hands for, uh, that's your job. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's art by committee, you know, but so you got a lot of people putting together the project, but also too many chefs, you know, in the kitchen spoil the food. And so you want to keep a limited number of chefs. Uh, maybe you should have a sous chef and then the dude chopping the vegetables, uh, but the dude chopping the vegetables shouldn't take over the sous chef's job. You know, it's really, you got to keep it controlled. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm very fortunate, um, lucky, but yeah, I'm, I've worked pretty hard at it too, to be where I'm at in the business, but I've made lots of mistakes. So I would like to help people who I think have skill and talent and not make those mistakes, or if they did try to dig them out of those mistakes to get a really quality project seen. Um, the real issue is anyone who, who is a filmmaker who's in the business knows for every movie that actually gets seen by an audience, there's a thousand that never were, but were completed in, in film, but they never got through post. They never got through. They ran out of money. Uh, the film fell apart because of legal issues, um, personal spats. Uh, you know, so in a lot of ways, it's easy to make, to shoot a movie. It's almost impossible to, to finish it and even more difficult to get it out to an audience. So one thing that I like to think as a producer, when I wasn't there from ground zero is to help guide, guide the people from film is now in the can to let's get it out to the world. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that we're talking about is the film festival uh, circuit, which now is in not just a free fall, but it's a free fall with occasional cliffs sticking out. So, you know, you fall for a while and your forehead hits it and then you go a little farther and then your ankle catches a tree limb and and because you almost think that you can actually grab onto something. And so we're having to completely refigure our our plans because um, as I explained to people, a film festival release uh, for a first time filmmaker um, or even a veteran filmmaker who does not have a studio deal is the festival circuit is kind of like a long runway. And your first festival is kind of where you bring your plane out from the hangar for people to see it and it's shiny and pretty. And as you coast down that runway, uh, you're passing more and more festivals. And so film agents and potential buyers, uh, studios are seeing this thing coast and pick up speed and pick up speed. And then after your last festivals, hopefully you're in the air, you've caught the attention of some of these folks and they want to take it and they want to land it somewhere big. Uh, the problem right now is even our, we haven't gotten out of the hangar <laughs> because we're still waiting on a couple festivals that we should have heard from a couple weeks ago. And so now they're like, uh, hang on, we'll, we'll let you know. And so it's a matter of, all right, are we pushing our whole festival launch to say September, which will now push our everything to then. But it's not like, by the way, folks, the, vi the virus is going to be over, you know, August 1st so we can get back to business. We just don't know uh, which festivals will be operating and which won't and which will be going online and which won't. Because a lot of people don't understand once one festival decides to put all their stuff online, other festivals have rules that your film cannot be online anywhere. So all of a sudden you have to rethink your entire plan and that's what we're in the process of doing. Um, it's terrifying and exciting because there's no rules to it. Um, there's also terrifying because there's no rules to it, but you know, so, but we're drafting multiple plans to directly reach out to not only salespeople, but continue the festival reach, but also start reaching out to, studios and networks because they're looking for material too. You know, all production is shut down. So they can only do so many episodes of Jeopardy with no audiences involved, you know, for the next five months. So it's always good when you have a finished property 
we're on the, the edge of the end of World War II, the 75th anniversary, and there will be almost no celebrations throughout the world because of the virus. So here's an opportunity for us to be able to put something either on network or cable or on a huge release to celebrate those who can't even come out to celebrate it. Um, and so that's what we're pursuing as well. We're trying to figure out how we can get this out. Normally you wouldn't want to try to get it out right away. As I said, you'd want to do the festival run, but as all bets are off, let's find other crap tables to go to and figure this out. Well, David, it's been really exciting to have you on here. I really appreciate your input. And um, I think we need to have you back uh, the further we go down the road in terms of festivals and, and uh, just kind of like you described, where is this film going to go? And, well, that's uh, if I'm still shiny and Christian likes me. Because, you know, it, it, <laughs> I can't pass by that. So. I can't imagine that. But I do think we would like to have you back because I think we are in the wild west of um, what's going to happen in the production world. I think it's going to change a lot. I read a really interesting article this week. So uh, we certainly will have you back. We'll talk about that. Thank you uh, for being here today. And thank you for everything that you've done for us on this film. We really appreciate you. Well, it's just the beginning. So Absolutely. onward and upward. <laughs> well, hey, everyone, uh, thanks for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. See you later.